Good morning, and welcome to the second of two videos on chapter two in our text, uh, all about research methods that are used by psychologists. Uh, we're going to begin this video by talking about what's known as the third variable problem. All right. Um, and this is kind of an end to our discussion of correlations. Now, correlations are certainly more effective and more valuable um, to researchers than descriptive uh, observations, but um, they, they can tell you what's going to happen, but they don't tell you why it's happening. All right, so they, they, uh, strong correlations allow predictability of outcome, but they do not imply causality. They don't uh, give you that cause and effect relationship here. Only a controlled experiment can allow for us to determine uh, what causes a certain effect. Um, and the difficulty is uh, with uh, correlations is that there may be a third variable involved, and that third variable has to be controlled for. Now, the third variable problem is an explanation of a correlation between two variables in terms of another, a third variable, that could possibly be responsible for the observed relationship between the two variables. All right. And any researcher uh, doing a correlation study uh, must control for the third variables in order to make a cause and effect statement. Now, what this means is, or let me give you an example of this. All right. There are a couple of very good examples in your uh, textbook here. All right. Um, I'm going to go through uh, one of them. All right. Uh, it says that uh, there's a positive correlation between a student's SAT scores and the number of television sets that his family owns. OK, let's think about that. Do you really think that the number of television sets in a house determines what your SAT score is? And yet, the, that is, uh, it, it's, it was a strong correlation, okay? Um, now, it, this obviously doesn't mean that watching TV is going to boost your SAT scores. As a matter of fact, uh, that's probably very unlikely. As a matter of fact, it's probably just the opposite. Kids who watch too much TV probably don't have uh, very strong or, or uh, high SAT scores. Um, but what it does mean is that there's probably a third variable there. Well, what might that third variable be? The third variable might be uh, par parental income, all right? Parents who have more money might be able to afford more TVs. They also might be able to afford tutors for their students to go uh, before they take to go to before they take the SAT exams, thus resulting in a better score. And so, although uh, the number of TVs in the house and the SAT scores are uh, correlated, that doesn't mean that they are causal. All right, the number of TVs doesn't cause the SAT scores. All right, so um, there are a few other examples in your textbook about that as well. Now I want to move on to the third and final research method, um, and by far the most effective method in determining uh, the cause and the effect for uh, a certain uh, phenomenon. The key to experimental research is that the researcher has to control every aspect of the experiment except for the variable that's being manipulated, whatever they're, they're changing. Okay, uh, They have to control for uh, third variables all right, by making sure that everything is held constant in all of their groups. Um, they also, uh, well, Let's let's uh, stick with that. So what it means is that if, if you're going to compare two different groups, you have to have a control group and then the experimental group where you're manipulating that the variable that you're interested in. And then you keep everything else the same. So if you're going to measure, um, you know, the um, the effect of um, uh, hours of study on grades. That means that everybody in both groups has to have the same amount of food, the same amount of sleep, the same uh, opportunities to, to do this, that, and the other thing, the same uh, laptop, the same everything that you can control, you need to control. Um, and, and that eliminates the whole third variable problem. However, in experiments, you also have to be um, 
cognizant of the possible influence of individual characteristics of the subjects, right? Some, you know, on average, some folks are going to be smarter than others. Some folks are going to be taller than others. Some folks are going to be fatter than others and so on. Um, and so uh, there's really no way to control that unless you did your experiment with a hundred clones of the same person. All right, and since that's not really going to happen, um, the way that we control for this in experimental research is we use very large groups with what we call random assignments. Okay, now um, what that means is that uh, you take a group of a hundred people, and there's people of all walks of life, right? Um, you know, they're they're uh, young and old and tall and short and, um, you know, fat and skinny and, and everything else, right? Whatever, they're just, they're random. And then you simply take uh, 50 of them at random and put them in the control group and the other 50 and you put them in the experimental group, all right? And this is referred to as random assignment, all right? It's a control measure. And in this uh, random assignment, basically what you do is you take all of your participants and you randomly assign each one to a specific group. And uh, because they're randomly assigned, that is believed to equalize the participant characteristics across the various groups. And so you'll have the same number of males and females in each group. You'll have the same number of fat people and skinny people, tall people and short people. Um, you know, whatever it, whatever uh, characteristics you might want to uh, control for, you can, uh, by randomly assigning them, you can um, eliminate the, those characteristics as issues in your uh, experiment. And this is one of the benefits of an experiment because you can then control for the influences of those characteristics. <clears throat> um, on the behavior that you're that you happen to be measuring now this is not the same thing as random sampling which we talked about earlier um, random sampling is a technique to get a, uh, a a representative sample all right in other words you know everybody in uh, the groups there's an equal number of republicans and democrats males and females um, and so uh, the, the two things are related all right, but they're not the same because you can use random sampling in other um, uh, research techniques. You, um, but random assignment is done only in an experiment because you're taking individuals and putting them in each one. All right, there's a there's a uh, an important distinction there. All right, random sampling means that that the people you're observing are chosen. Uh, randomly from a large population so that everybody has an equal chance of being chosen for your um, for your study. Random assignment means that once you've randomly sampled this group, you then take it, divide it in half, and randomly put each person in one of the two groups that you are measuring. All right, so they're they they're similar, of course, and of course they both begin with the word random, but they're not the same. Okay, they're not the same. Okay, so once you've done uh, your random sampling and then your random assignment, what's the next step in designing an experiment? Well, um, in this case, what you need to do is identify what the independent and dependent variables are. All right, an independent variable is uh, the variable that is the uh, believed cause and therefore uh, of, of some effect, whatever it happens to be. And it's therefore the thing that is manipulated by the experimenter. All right. So, for example, if you wanted to determine um, uh, whether music um, causes changes in plant growth, okay, um, what you would have to do is uh, change the music. All right. And so what you'd have is uh, the independent variable would be, for example, music or no music, or maybe you'd use uh, no music, country music, and rap music, all right? Um, but though that would be the independent variable, the type of music played, okay? The dependent variable is the variable that is affected here by the independent variable, and therefore it's measured, 
All right. So the independent variable is thought to be the cause and it's manipulated. The dependent variable is thought to be affected and is therefore measured by the experiment. All right. And the dependent variable in my little music flower experiment would be uh, the height of the flowers. All right. How tall do they grow? All right. Does and we uh, would ask the question, does music have an effect on the um, uh, the growth of plants? So an experiment is a research method in which the researcher manipulates one or more independent variables. All right and measures their effects on one or more dependent variables. Now, um, I took the one or more right out of your textbook, but in reality, one is best, all right? The simpler an experiment is, the more uh, powerful the results are going to be, all right? And so you don't wanna design an experiment that's got, that, that's got too many things going on, all right? You wanna try to control everything except the one thing that you're looking at. All right, that's that's important when you design an experiment. The two groups, of course, are going to be called the experimental group and the control group. And the uh, experimental group is the one that's exposed to whatever the independent variable is. All right. Uh, uh, in my example, the experimental group would be the group of plants that are exposed to music. All right. The control group, on the other hand, is exactly the same as the experimental group except that there's no music all right everything else is the same they have the same size pots they have the same amount of soil they get the same amount of sunlight they get the same amount of water um you know anything else that you can think of for for growing plants okay now when you design an experiment there's a couple of things that you need to um know and to look out for um, first, you have to have an operational definition, and this is essentially uh, a fancy way of saying that you have to have a very specific set of procedures that you're going to follow in order to test your hypothesis. So by definition, it is uh, a description of the operations or procedures that a researcher uses to manipulate or measure a variable. And so, uh, what you do is you write all of this down in what we call a methods section, all right? And we'll be talking about this in lab next week, all right? But it, it's essentially a, a cookbook um, of instructions that tells um, you what procedure to follow, but it also tells people that are looking at your research exactly what you did. Now, there's a couple of things that you have to be uh, careful about when you're de uh, designing an experiment. And the first one uh, is what's called the placebo effect, okay? Um, the placebo effect is improvement, for example, in um, a patient in a hospital, for example, due to the expectation of improving because of receiving treatment, all right? Um, and this is done in a lot of medical studies where <clears throat> you can't just take a, you know, two groups of people, make one the control and one the experimental and give one uh, medicine that's that you think is going to make them better and not give the other one anything. All right. What you have to do is you have to give the control group a placebo, which literally, I think in Greek means sugar pill. In other words, it's a pill but it doesn't have any medicine in it, all right? And so the people who are in the control group believe that they're in the experimental group, or at least don't know whether they're in the experimental or the control, okay? And so, uh, because sometimes there's a psychological effect on patients and they can show signs of improvement in their conditions because they think they're gonna get better, all right? And that's called the placebo effect. <coughs> now, <coughs> the placebo group is the control group of participants who believe that they're receiving treatment, but are who, who are really only receiving a placebo. And the placebo itself is an inactive pill or a treatment that has no known effects. All right. And so when you design an experiment, you've got to be careful about that. All right. Um, especially with um, human subjects, all right, because their psychology can 
uh, play a role in what results you get. Now, once you've uh, done your uh, experiment and gone through your methods, you have to use a mathematical analysis called statistics in order to uh, draw conclusions about your results. These are what's known as inferential statistical analyses. And these are statistical analyses that allow researchers to draw conclusions about the results of a study by determining the probability that the results are due to random variation or, or just by chance alone. All right. Sometimes, you know, you do a, an experiment and your experimental group and your um, control group turn out to be very different. Sometimes they turn out to be uh, exactly the same. And so what statistics do is they tell you uh, mathematically, based on a, uh, the probability rules, whether or not the two groups are actually different. Now, scientists generally uh, accept results as statistically significant, okay? Uh, if the probability is 0 0.05 or less, all right? So if you calculate a statistic and you get a p-value, a probability value of 0 0.05 or less, <coughs> that indicates that your two groups are probably different from one another. If your probability value is greater than 0 0.05, um, then that probably means that your two groups are the same, at least statistically the same. Now we'll talk about this a lot more in lab when we get through, uh, when we get to the methods um, and how to calculate some statistics. But uh, for now, just know that less than 0.05 means that the two groups are statistically different and greater than 0.05 means that they are statistically uh, the same, all right? Another thing that scientists can use uh, in order to uh, prevent their own biases from coming in um, is what we call a double blind procedure. And this is a control measure in, which an ex in an experiment in which neither the experimenters nor the participants know which participants are in the experimental and control groups, all right? This is important because it can lead to biased data. All right, for example, I'm a doctor and I'm doing research on a new cancer drug, all right? And I know exactly which of my patients have are getting the new medication and which of them are getting the placebo, all right? And I walk into uh, the examination room of one of the patients who's getting the, uh, the drug, and I say, how are you feeling today? Feeling any better? You know, how, how's everything going? You, everything good, right? Yeah, all right. And then I walk into the patient's room uh, who's taking the placebo and I say, how are you doing today? You sure you're okay? Yeah, feeling better? No, maybe? Okay, just in my approach as the researcher, I can be giving hints to the patients about what drug they actually are on. And so what a double blind procedure does is it, it allows me to examine each patient in either group um, independently without knowing what effect they're, they've got, right? Now, somebody obviously has to know, all right? But um, that might be, you know, some other person, all right? My, my partner uh, over here, he knows which, which folks are doing them, but he's not doing the examinations. I do the examinations, and then he takes the data and, and uh, analyzes it. All right. And that way I can't give away anything. All right. And this is what's known as a double blind uh, procedure. OK. All right. Now, last thing that I want to uh, talk about today is something called meta analysis. In today's day and age of high powered computers and that sort of thing, we can take not just one study and not just look at the hundred people in my experiment, but we can look at uh, large numbers of studies, not just large numbers of patients, but large numbers of studies um, that all examine uh, one particular experimental question. And we can analyze them and come up with an overall conclusion. All right, and this is known as meta-analysis. So 
I'm going to take my results and the results of, you know, 30 other doctors in the United States and 60 doctors in China and, you know, 10 doctors in Germany and whatever. Um, and we're going to combine them all into one big study, and that's called a meta-analysis. All right. And there are people, uh, mostly computer folks these days, uh, who take that data and and analyze it on the large scale in order to, to determine uh, whether everybody's kind of coming to the same conclusion. All right. So that is uh, meta analysis. All right. So that is the uh, the third and final. No, the second and final uh, video on chapter two in your textbook. All right. Uh, just so that you are aware. We will have a quiz on um, uh, sections uh, one or no, I lied. Never mind. Uh, we'll we'll leave it at that. Um, we're just going to have um, move on on Tuesday and uh, start the third section of chapter one. All right. So have a great day, and I hope you learned something.